Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Explained Series with your host, Dr. Brett Palmer. In The Explained Series, we take a medical topic, usually sexually health related, and explain it. And today it's the turn of Cryptococcus neoformans. And uh, what is uh, so special about Cryptococcus neoformans? Well, it's an encapsulated yeast, so it's basically a fungal infection. It's found everywhere in the environment. Now, usually it is a harmless infection. Everyone will have come into contact with it sometime in their life. Um, and it causes no problems. But if you're immune suppressed, that's, that could mean you could be a transplant patient or you have lymphoma like Hodgkin's lymphoma or psychosis, uh, or as I'm a HIV doctor, uh, you could be uh, immunosuppressed due to HIV infection, then cryptococcus um, can cause uh, quite a few problems. And this is what I'm going to be uh, talking about in this particular episode. Now, before highly active antiretroviral anti therapy started, cryptococcus occurred in about 10% of individuals infected with HIV in the UK. Depending on you, where you were in the world, that could very well be a higher um, uh, amount. But since uh, heart or highly active antiretroviral therapy, uh, the incidence has considerably dropped. And it's uh, relatively, in my experience, it's relatively uh, rare to see outside London. But if you work in a big uh, London uh, tertiary centre, then it's actually quite um, uh, common uh, to see. Uh, so who gets uh, uh, cryptococcosis? Well, uh, everyone has got in contact with it and you usually get your first infection around about childhood. And it's uh, asymptomatic, children just brush it off and we don't really uh, heal, hear or see of it uh, ever again. Uh, and there's different types of um, cryptococcus uh, disease. So uh, cryptococcal neoformans um, uh, gurubi, uh, hopefully that's the correct way of pronouncing it, um, is uh, um, the most commonly associated cryptococcal disease in the UK. Uh, and that's serotype A, because there's a few different types. You have other uh, types and species associated with pigeons droppings, or um, that's been found on uh, eucalyptus leaves, uh, but it's found everywhere in the environment, so it's not really a surprise that it's found in some of these weird and wonderful places. Um, so how do you catch it? Well, uh, as I said, as a kid, you can catch it by inhaling it. And so that's how adults catch it as well. Uh, you inhale the organism uh, and that causes localised disease uh, within uh, the lungs. Uh, without any kind of treatment, uh, the yeast will rapidly spread from the lungs into the blood and has its very uh, neurotropic um, uh, fungus. That means it seeks out uh, the neurosystem and you will eventually develop cryptococcal meningitis. It's uh, effectively and only a matter of time. And the progression uh, from the blood to the brain can be quite rapid. Other sites of the disease that can uh, be uh, affected uh, are the skin, uh, and the skin lesions we'll have a look at later. They resemble molluscum contagiosum, which are small um, um, uh, uh, lesions which are, uh, uh, have a dip in the middle, um, and sometimes you can squeeze out uh, uh, pus from them. And uh, the lesions associated with cryptococcosis skin lesions appear very much like that. Again, we'll have a look at it later. Uh, and also it can, uh, cryptococcus can hide out in the prostate gland as a sanctuary site. And when in the people who are immunosuppressed, in other words, have a very low CD4 count, um, uh, the prostate gland can be a sanctuary site um, for um, seeding future infections if they are not put on anti highly active antiretroviral. So I said that uh, after a lung infection goes to the blood and then goes to the brain and the brain is what we're going to be concentrating on because that's the one that causes uh, the most uh, problems. And now in terms of a brain infection, how does uh, meningitis effectively present? Well, the commonest symptoms is um, headache and a fever, uh, usually raised intracranial pressure, and that can also be associated with nausea. It's a feeling of uh, feeling sick, vomiting, being sick, uh, confusion and coma. And then that obviously, if not, no treatment is there, uh, uh, then leads to death, unfortunately. So cryptococcal meningitis is a, uh, can be associated uh, just with the respiratory um, symptoms, uh, just have uh, localised pulmonary disease uh, as well as uh, the skin. And in terms of the skin lesions, uh, there are some lesions on the forehead, uh, on the hand, uh, and these are typical uh, molluscum contagion. This is what molluscum contagiosum effectively looks like. Um, but obviously, if we know that a patient's HIV 
uh, positive and is immunosuppressed, uh, these lesions may be very well more widespread uh, around the body. Um, what you can also get as well is contagious cryptocosis, uh, which is what you see in the, uh, the last photo uh, on the right hand side. <coughs> In terms of the lung presentation, um, individuals may present non-specifically, a little bit of a fever, a bit of a cough, sometimes with and without sputum, sometimes with and without uh, shortness of breath. The chest x-ray uh, may show um, infiltration or uh, an abscess or even pure effusions, um, but it's only a matter of time before it goes to um, uh, the brain and meningitis. And there might be other um, uh, presentations as well. So, for example, um, cryptococcosis may just stay in the blood uh, and not, uh, they may not present with meningitis yet or with overt uh, uh, lung disease. And that, uh, that may be a, a typical, as it were, old fashioned septicemia, fever, night sweats, uh, shaking, which is rigors. Um, uh, you have rare manifestations, which I've never seen, that includes ocular palsy, papular um, edema, uh, chorioresinitis, and also bone lesions as well. And I've never seen them uh, uh, personally. So uh, how do you diagnose it? Well, the simplest way of doing it is doing a blood test, which is called uh, a CRAG, C-R-A-G, which is a serum cryptococcal antigen. Okay, now if someone has a positive uh, CRAG, um, you have to then go on to do a lumbar puncture after a CT and MRI scan is performed. Okay, and the reason why, and usually it's a CT scan because they're quicker to obtain uh, in the UK in some hospitals I've worked at, but either one will do um, because you're trying to rule out other brain pathology and if it's safe to do a lumbar puncture. And it's very important that goes on the request form. And so whenever you put a request form in for radiology or if you put a request form into microbiology, it's very much you have to put in the details of the things you want to do. And so a request form for a CT scan is you want to make it plainly clear um, uh, that it's uh, safe for you to perform a lumbar puncture. And just so the radiologist uh, knows what you're thinking of and what you're intending to do uh, with um, uh, the results he's reporting. So a positive, and, and after you've done a lumbar puncture, so after you've done a CT scan, you're going to do a lumbar puncture, which we'll, we'll come on to later. Uh, and then you take some of that uh, fluid off uh, a lumbar puncture and you send it off for CSF, cryptococcal antigen. Okay, and that's the most sensitive diagnostic test. If it's negative, that's fantastic, okay? Um, but if it's positive, uh, it will affect the management of HIV underlying uh, the cryptococcal diagnosis. Um, uh, when you're doing a lumbar puncture, you also need to perform manometry, but we'll come on to that uh, at a later time. In fact, now, uh, so CSF uh, manometry should always be performed. So what is that? Well, when you do a lumbar puncture, uh, you need to, you can do it in a sitting position or the lying position. Now, sometimes the sitting position is actually easier because it is, um, you have a, a higher uh, hit rate, if, uh, if you like, uh, of getting to the CSF. Um, and it's very, very common, uh, for example, when pregnant women are having um, epidurals or you're having a quick sample to have uh, someone sitting in the, in the sitting position. This is no good if you want to test uh, if there is intracranial pressure. In other words, there's a, a higher uh, CSF pressure, okay? Because all that's happened is all the CSF in the head is just going to go straight down to where uh, he's um, putting the tap into the back of the spine. And so the patient has to be lying flat, okay? It was called in the lateral position. And in the picture, someone there is lying in the left lateral position. Uh, and after you've uh, put in uh, the needle and you're getting a bit of CSF back, before you take any samples, you have to do um, uh, put in um, uh, a manometer, uh, which is a vertical tube you see in the picture there. Sorry, it's not clear as the pictures. And that tube fits into the, uh, the tap. And then you open the tap and let the uh, CSF fluid flow up uh, the tube. And then you can read how high the pressure of CSF is. Okay, and after you've read off the pressure, you then take uh, the CSF um, out of, of the individual for analysis. Now, why is that important? Well, um, uh, cryptococcal meningitis can cause a raised CSF, and it's very important because if it's 
too high, that can cause uh, a lot of problems. And so you need to reduce uh, the CSF. So if it's greater than 250 millimeters uh, of uh, water uh, or HDO, uh, you then need to reduce it to below 200 or 50 percent of the initial pressure. And sometimes you have to repeat the lump of punctures on a daily basis until um, the CSF pressure is stable. OK, uh, now if the patient also deteriorates, you also need to perform uh, or repeat uh, the lumbar puncture as well. Um, some cases are very, very resistant to a raised intracranial pressure. For those individuals, you'll need to speak to the neurosurgeons because you may need to put in a shunt. Uh, now, obviously, the people who are resistant are people who are having treatment for quite some time and it's not going away. Uh, I don't mean uh, a couple of days. Um, now, people say, well, what about cortical steroids? Because you give that for metastasis to the brain, for example. Well, uh, when you've got a mass in the brain, what you're trying to do is reduce the swelling of the tissues and corticosteroids or azithromycin and all those sorts of things can help out with those different types of brain swelling. Um, but with um, uh, cryptococcal uh, meningitis, uh, steroids don't because there's, no, there's nothing wrong with the brain as such. It's just the infected layers outside the brain, the meninges, uh, which is being affected, and that is encouraging an overproduction of CSF fluid or not allowing CSF fluid to drain correctly. So the steroids effectively won't help in any way, shape or form. So all HIV patients presenting with a CD4 count of less than 200 and have symptoms of uh, cryptococcus uh, should have the disease excluded uh, through uh, serum cryptococcal uh, antigen. That's a CRAG test. Um, and uh, generally, a negative uh, test excludes disseminated cryptococcal disease, uh, which is a, a great result. Now, uh, you can get a false positive cryptococcal antigen, and so, for example, it has a positive rheumatoid factor or anti, um, anti typical antibodies, um, but you can also get a, um, a cryptococcal antigen that may be negative in isolated pulmonary disease. So, if they've got pulmonary disease um, and you do a, a CRAG, it could very well be negative if it hasn't gone anywhere further. Um, however, if they've got uh, lung disease and you know the HIV positive with a low CD4 count, they will, they will need a, um, a bowel, um, which is a bronchial alveolar lavage, as quick as possible, um, because then you can uh, make the diagnosis on the washings of, from the lung. Uh, and then if it, if it is cryptococcal disease, you can start management uh, very quickly. And also to all those other things like uh, PCP or now PJP. That's another subject for um, another lecture, probably next time round. <coughs> so, uh, all patients with a positive CRAG should have a CT scan or an MRI, then go on to have a lumbar puncture. Uh, with a lumbar puncture, you always do um, uh, manometry uh, to exclude raised intracranial pressure, and if it is uh, high, it needs to be drained off. I'm going to quickly stop there for a moment just to quickly say if you can't um, if you can't do manometry and you can only get the CSF sample in a seated, seated position still get a sample of CSF okay and then what you do is you just book with an interventional radiologist uh, or someone who's more experienced in, in uh, doing a lumbar puncture uh, in the lateral position in order to confirm uh, if there's raised intracranial pressure OK, so uh, it's very important uh, that monitoring is performed uh, even uh, if you can't do it yourself. OK, so if it's safe to do a lumbar puncture, get the sample. However, uh, even if it's in a seated position, but if they if you can't, uh, you can't do monitoring in the seated position, obviously. Um, but the sample is very important because if that sample, if that CSF is negative, uh, then uh, you can relax a little bit uh, and then. But if it's positive, uh, get an interventional radiologist to um, do the monotry in the lateral position. Anyway, and the CSF should also uh, always be sent off for fungal culture. And this is where the microbiologist is your best friend um, because he will be able to expedite and speed up uh, the procedures um, and uh, will hopefully be able to uh, get the fungal culture, if not done at his hospital, will now be able to get it off to susceptibility testing uh, wherever facilities exist. So it's very important to speak to the microbiologist on the phone as well as put on um, the request form 
uh, for the fungal culture that you need a uh, fungal culture for microscopy, culture and sensitivities, M, C and S. So, OK, you've got a patient, you've got cryptococcus uh, meningitis and you're saying, well, what's the prognostic? Well, how, how's, it, how's it looking, doc? Um, well, uh, if you've got a, a positive blood culture from the blood, that's a bad sign, unfortunately. Uh, also is um, a low white cell count in the CSF because that means they're not, it's not mounting a response. Also, a high CSF, CSF cryptococcal antigen uh, is not good because um, that means uh, the higher the number, the more active the disease. And if the patient is generally in a confused state or has uh, raised intracranial pressure, these are all put, um, poor prognostic markers, unfortunately. So what's the treatment? Well, you first have to use induction therapy. Now, the standard induction therapy uh, course for cryptococcal meningitis is liposomal amphotericin B at 4 milligrams per kilogram per day IV. It's usually combined uh, with flucytosine, 100 milligrams per kilogram um, per day. Now, you can also use uh, fluconazole uh, instead. So if someone uh, only has lung symptoms or is generally very, very well, um, uh, then you can uh, step down and just use fluconazole, 400 milligrams a day plus flucytosine. Uh, Iotroconazole um, is less active than fluconazole, so why bother using that when fluconazole is yeah, easier to use and uh, I think it may even be cheaper. Um, uh, alternatively, uh, depending uh, if there's standard regimes of failing, failing, you can use polyconazole or prostaconazole. These are very, very expensive um, and uh, this is why it's important to get sensitivities um, of a, a fungal culture. Uh, and you also need to start heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy um, uh, when it is reasonable to do so. Now, you don't start it straight away. OK, even if a patient has a known HIV, they've been on HIV medication and they've decided for whatever um, misunderstood reason, they decided to stop their treatment. Um, you don't restart on the day you see them, you have to wait, okay? And you usually wait for two weeks until the induction therapy has been completed. Um, this, uh, this is because if you start treatment straight away, this can cause like a, an iris type syndrome, which is a immune reconstitution syndrome in the brain, which can cause massive brain swelling, which can kill patients, okay? And there is an increased mortality, so an increased death rate has been observed in patients who start in, uh, antiretroviral therapy within 72 hours of starting treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. And there's a code study, C-O-A-T, code study. Uh, I think my face is uh, obscuring that particular word, unfortunately. Bad, bad luck for you. Um, uh, and the code study um, uh, highlighted uh, this problem. And so it is, so generally you start heart for cryptococcal meningitis two weeks, two weeks, after in, um, uh, you've started uh, therapy. So you do the induction therapy, and at the end of the induction therapy, you start maintenance therapy, and at the same time, you can then start heart, okay? A highly active antiretroviral therapy. So, uh, flutitazine, what's the point of that? Why do you add in this flutitazine? Um, well, that speeds the rate of sterilization of the CSF and reduces the incidence of relapse um, in, uh, and that's generally seen in patients not receiving highly active antiretroviral therapy okay so a lot of this stuff was done before highly active antiretroviral therapy there are studies going on now in some london hospitals to look at uh, what happens if you uh, to, to re-examine this particular area but either way <coughs> uh, fluzitazine is shown to, in, uh, to enhance uh, uh, toxicity in some studies and has also been shown not to impact on early or late um, uh, mortality. Okay, um, and is it worth doing? I think it is because uh, as doctors, we like to um, uh, increase the rate of sterilization of CSF because you don't want it uh, obviously to come back. But the good thing about fluzitazine, it can be described orally or intravenously as well. But it is associated with hemological toxicity, and so really the, uh, the patient will need daily blood counts uh, to monitor. There's nothing uh, funny going on um, uh, uh, with their uh, blood levels. Okay, um, and also 
The reason why we use liposine more than amphotericin B is because standard amphotericin B is really renal toxic. Um, and so if they've got any renal problems or they've got ongoing, they're either having other renally toxic drugs at the same time, uh, you really need to have a, a quick, uh, to have a close look like daily renal bloods. Um, but you can minimize this risk by using liposomal amphotericin B as a first choice agent, okay? So the maintenance therapy, so you've done the induction therapy, that's two weeks, you now go on to the maintenance therapy. And incidentally, this is where you start uh, antiretroviral therapy as well for the HIV. So the preferred maintenance therapy is fluconazole, 400 milligrams once a day orally, um, and that can go on for 10 weeks, okay? And then after 10 weeks, you reduce it to 200 milligrams a day uh, for secondary prophylaxis, okay? Um, secondary prophylaxis meaning someone who has had cryptococcus and you're preventing it from coming back again. Now the lump will punch out two weeks um, uh, at the end of induction therapy and having uh, CSF cultures uh, performed can be done if people are worried that there's been a poor response to the induction therapy. And some people actually prolong induction therapy until they get their CSF cultures back, especially if the patient is not responding. And that's absolutely uh, fine as well. Okay, so, uh, you have to remember medicine is, a, is very much how the, you're not treating the results, you're treating the patient. If the patient's not responding, probably the patient's not getting any better despite what the blood results show. Um, so, pulmonary disease, so the disease just in the lung as well. Um, so, that's due to rapid regression of meningitis. Um, and usually, it progresses rapidly to generalitis, but uh, some people, uh, it can be very, very mild, uh, their symptoms, and, and they can be treated with fluconazole 400 milli milligrams daily. Okay, um, but again, if they've got, I personally think if they've got meningitis, uh, I would give liposomal amphotericin B um, uh, 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 as, as a first choice. Okay, uh, if they're allergic to it, uh, then, uh, then you can give fluconazole. If they don't have uh, meningitis, uh, then uh, I'll be tempted to start them with fluconazole 400 milligrams daily. Uh, but this is in the guidelines, and so you've got the B, the guidelines, you've got the ECAS, which is European guidelines, and you've got the American guidelines. Uh, and they're very much uh, similar to what they're saying regarding uh, treatment of cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, in terms of routine prophylaxis, so you've got a patient who effectively is well, they turn up on your doorstep with a CD4 count of uh, 20, uh, a viral load of say 120,000, um, and they're absolutely fine. Uh, should you start them on fluconazole 200 milligrams a day to prevent cryptococcosis um, or cryptococcal meningitis? Uh, no, you don't, okay? Um, you only start it uh, if you think, um, you only treat them for cryptococcal meningitis if you uh, they are ill and you have diagnosed it and it's in their blood. Okay, and you only test for it if they have the signs and symptoms. Uh, as a general rule, um, uh, if someone does have cryptococcosis meningitis and uh, you've uh, done induction therapy, you've done the maintenance therapy for 10 weeks after the two weeks induction, then you start the once you, con you reduce the fluconazole from 400 to 200, and that is a secondary prophylaxis, and that continues until the CD4 count is above 100 and they are undetectable for three months, okay? So that means they're gonna be on um, uh, fluconazole 200 milligrams for at least three months, okay? Uh, keep your eye out on those uh, renal uh, bloods, uh, just and, uh, and other markers as well. Okay, these are some of the uh, great websites I've used to help um, put these uh, slides together. So thank you uh, to them and thank you all, all to the charities. I hope you found this, uh, and I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, if you uh, like this episode and uh, like the channel, please like, subscribe, and share. And I hope you have uh, good sexual health. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and tune into next week's. Uh, sorry, uh, tune into two weeks uh, for the next episode. Take care, and uh, yeah, have good sexual health. Bye bye.